let's take a look at some of the uh, reaction and results here uh, with Kevin Pelton, ESPN.com, NBA insider here. And how good will this new Sixers team look? It's a lot bigger. It's a lot different. Only two guys are out. Redick and Butler are out, and two guys, Richardson and Horford, uh, are in. So let's start with that, Kevin. Uh, did you like the move that Elton Brand made, essentially swapping out Butler uh, for Richardson and then bringing Horford in, and they let Redick walk? I generally did. I mean, it's you know one of the most interesting – if you want to consider it one transaction, obviously it's a couple technically. One of the most interesting moves of the off season because this was a team that was so good last year in the playoffs, gave Toronto the toughest test they got the entire time in the postseason. And I think based on that, everyone kind of said, okay, they're just going to run it back. But, you know, the concerns about the how Jimmy Butler is going to age on that contract, the desire to have, you know, I think, uh, you know, a, a more reliable alternative for Joel Embiid in the middle with Horford. And then the opportunity to get a really good young wing player in Josh Richardson. You know, it's it's a lineup that now, because of the fact that you've got more size, you don't have the target that you had in J.J. Redick defensively, has the potential to be better. But also we need to figure out who's going to be the, the go-to guy late in games when, you know, it's difficult for Embiid to play that role and Simmons hasn't been able to so far. This is a big team that got bigger. They, they This is going to be a very long and uh, lengthy team. But... Is that going to give them – I mean, they had problems last year against teams like Brooklyn who had the smaller, quicker guards. You know, when you're matched up against a Kyrie Irving, uh, a Kemba Walker, is that a concern with this big lineup getting bigger? Well, I think that's where Josh Richardson is so important because that is a role that he's played in Miami. You know, I went through and looked at it uh, when that trade – or when that yeah, when the trade first came down. And, you know, according to the second spectrum tracking data that we have access to at ESPN – Point guard was the position he defended most frequently last season, although that's, you know, impacted a little bit by the fact that they played so much zone defense. But, you know, he's a better option there than Redick or Jimmy Butler were because that's not really the strength of Jimmy Butler's game. And, you know, I think that's a benefit they're looking at of this move rather than, uh, you know, a downside. When you look at the East and, you know, where the Sixers come into play, is there any sleeper team out there? Because, you know, Mike and I talked about it earlier in the show it's Sixers Bucks that's everyone's immediate answer at least for today but the Pacers they're an interesting team Butler down in Miami let's see what they do if they add a Russell Westbrook is there another East team that you really have your eye on this year that's not the Sixers or the Bucks I would say Boston. I mean, Indiana is interesting if Oladipo is able to come back at the same all-star level he played at the last two seasons before the injury. I liked their offseason, but, you know, that's not going to happen until midseason, and expecting Oladipo to come back and immediately be that guy is probably unrealistic. So, you know, I think Boston, obviously, happier locker room with the move from Kyrie Irving to Kemba Walker. The loss of Horford is a huge one, and we got to figure out how they replace him, but you know, if Jason takes a big step forward this year, if Jalen Brown is more effective, Gordon Hayward is closer to the pre-injury Gordon Hayward, then I could see that team making some noise and climbing up out of the uh, you know that second tier of these contenders and maybe getting into the top tier. When you look at the Sixers, you know Mike talks about their length, and that's going to be a huge positive. It's one of the criticisms that we have with them in the past is their lack of athleticism and length on the perimeter. Well, that's not really a criticism anymore but one criticism that's been a mainstay is their offense in the half court sets particularly late in games and i'm still kind of looking at that now in that aspect and saying well what are they what's their identity because they lose some shooting in jj reddick they get better on the defensive side like i said but on offense it's going to come down to ben simmons ability to not be a liability in the half court Where's the shooting going to come from? Where's the spacing going to come from? All of those offensive question marks, I think, are still there, are they not? They are, absolutely. I mean, I don't think it's necessarily a huge downgrade in terms of shooting. Another thing I looked at in the piece I did for ESPN Plus is if you look at catch-and-shoot threes over the last three seasons to increase that sample size, Richardson and Horford have made almost exactly as many catch-and-shoot threes as J.J. Redick and Jimmy Butler have over that span, largely mm-hmm. because of the fact that Butler doesn't take them. You know, their, their percentages are lower. They've taken a lot more of those shots, and you know that's it's kind of a trade-off there between you would like to have higher volume, but the, the percentage is obviously valuable 
uh, as well. But I don't think it's necessarily going to hurt their spacing, but it's the same question we already had of, you know, is Ben Simmons going to be able to take a step forward in that role and, uh, you know, just be able to, you know, not not make defenses able to play off him due to his lack of shooting late games. So I was Kevin Pelton, who, by the way, uh, was tweeting out about Thibel uh, the other day, uh, you know, how he's looked in the summer league. A lot of people were wondering about him catching and shooting and how he would look. What have you seen uh, from, from him so far down there in Vegas? So far, so good on that front. I mean, you know, obviously you don't want to read too much into a sample of, what, like 10 three-pointers or whatever it is he's attempted so far. But, you know, the form looks good. There hasn't been any uh, any negative impact of stretching that out a little bit longer to the NBA three-point line. He's been spending a lot of time in the corners, as you'd expect from someone making that transition. Uh, you know, the issue for him so far has been, I think he struggled when he's tried to put the ball on the ground. And that's not surprising as someone who watched him a lot in college at University of Washington. You know, that's not the strength of his game. He's a pretty good decision maker and passer when he's at a standstill, when he's, you know, entering the ball from the perimeter of the post. But when the game speeds up, that can be an issue for him. And, you know, defenders have been able to take advantage of that so far during summer league. All right, uh, you look at out west, obviously, this weekend, it all got turned on its head when Kawhi decided to go to the Clippers and then Paul George, that trade was made. Did you like what Oklahoma City was able to, I mean, I, I guess it was very, uh, you know, kind of disheartening to hear that, but I got to be honest, I, I almost, I feel like Presti kind of got bailed out here. Like, that team wasn't going to win a championship. They were going to constantly be like the five or six seed in the West. I always feel like they got a clean slate to start back over, and, and I love what they did. 100% agree. I mean, you know, they got an incredible haul. It's funny that right up until, you know, this January, when Chris Josh Porzingis got traded to uh, Dallas, you know, one thing I looked up at that point is no team had traded an unprotected future first-round pick in a couple of years, and no team had traded multiple first-round picks in the same trade in a couple of years. And now, all of a sudden, the first-round picks are flowing like crazy. We saw that with Anthony Davis in the Lakers trade uh, because of their desperation to get him. And now we've seen it again, an even bigger package with Paul George going to the Clippers because of the fact that, you know, I think from the Clippers' standpoint, they were looking at it as, excuse me, uh, they were looking at it as, we're not trading for Paul George, we're trading for Paul George and Kawhi Leonard because of the fact that we know that making this trade can secure the commitment from him. Yeah, they obviously, uh, I mean, the Oklahoma City really changed, but L.A. now, you got the Clippers and you got the Lakers. Are they your, you know, post free agent favorites, uh, you know, maybe, I don't even say the West, to win the league at this point. It seems that there's a lot of teams, but are they two at the top? The Clippers are my favorite right now. I mean, I think you can make an interesting case for Milwaukee just because of the fact that there's not as much depth in terms of championship contenders in the Eastern Conference. Milwaukee and Philly are the only clear contenders as you look at it at this point. And, you know, that gives that maybe the uh, the best team over there a better likelihood of getting out than any one team has in the Western Conference. But, uh, you know, it, it, this Clippers roster is pretty well built for the postseason. Now you've got multiple uh, long, athletic wing players who can handle the ball, create their own shot. And those guys are extremely valuable in postseason settings. I, I would also say in the West, I think Utah is right there in the mix. Nice, And then there's just a deep, tier of second team, a deep second tier of teams that, you know, were kind of maybe one move away or the right breakaway. And, you know, Denver, a nice move today to get Jeremy Grant, the former Sixer, to bolster their chances. Now, when you look at that deep tier of second teams out West, uh, it's weird to say, but the Golden State Warriors seem to now be in that second tier. Obviously, some injuries playing a factor. Kevin Durant, a huge loss, as we all know. But you know, Mike and I are, are talking a lot about the Golden State Warriors, and Mike doesn't really believe that they could be a playoff team, and that's not a ridiculous thing to say, and but it's ridiculous to hear. <laughs> so when you're talking about the Golden State Warriors, you know, what do you what do you expect from them this upcoming season with really just Steph Curry and Steve Kerr calling the shots? Well, you still get Draymond Green is, is a big part of it as well. But sure. you know, I think that health is going to be a critical factor for them. They need to keep Steph healthy, even though they've got a second you know, shot-creating guard now in D'Angelo Russell. And then what kind of production they're able to get on the wing is a big question mark because, you know, with the, the hard cap that they got after the sign-in trade for D'Angelo Russell, weren't, it lost Andre Iguodala naturally and also weren't able to replace him really with anyone in free agency making more than the minimum. So you're looking at 
Alec Burks, Glenn Robinson the third, uh, Alfonso McKinney, a holdover from last season. Those guys in the next for big minutes at small forward and on the wing, and you know that's one of those guys going to have to step forward and kind of be a reliable fifth starter for them, I think. Uh, Kevin Pelton's here with us. Uh, so you got uh, all these moves, everything's crazy, and then of course next year it adds with Durant. But is this as wide open as you've seen it kevin you've worked in the league you're obviously covered the league for a while is this is this good is this what basketball was is this what adam silver was hoping for or do they like to have the super team that everybody's going after i think there's pluses and minuses to both of them from the league standpoint i mean the warriors drove in the Cavs when lebron was there drove incredible tv ratings but you know i think that uh you know, the fact that a lot of these teams are in big markets, including Philly, I mean, that's a positive for the league. And there definitely is more uncertainty than we've seen for a while. I mean, I think it's easy to overstate it. Like, you know, 14-15 when LeBron went to Cleveland, I don't think they were, you know, overwhelming favorites going into that season. And no one knew the Warriors gonna, were going to rise up and become what they they became. So, you know, maybe there's a team we're not even looking at right now that uh, makes that similar leap and, uh, you know, does what the Warriors did in 2014-15 and means it's not so wide open. Uh, Kevin Pelton, and, uh, of course, uh, he was kind enough to join us on the Boardwalk Honda Hotline. By the way, he gave the Sixers an A for their trade with the Heat. It was a four-team trade. They got an A. Uh, Miami got a B, and uh, the Sixers got Richardson. They got Butler. There was other pieces that were going around. Uh, But uh, we'll see. It reshaped their look big time. Uh, Kevin, always appreciate it, man. All right. Thanks for having me.